Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Bitwig Studio and Music Production. This is lesson 5.18, and in this lesson, we're going to take a look at a very unique synthesizer that comes with Bitwig Studio, the organ synth. Now, the organ synth doesn't use classic subtractive synthesis techniques or FM synthesis techniques, and it certainly isn't like our drum synthesizers. So we're going to talk about how this organ is different, why it's a great teaching tool, and is going to lay the foundations for the other types of synthesis we're going to look at in the coming videos. I want to do a really quick just kind of crash course looking through the history of the organ to begin with, and then we're going to jump in here and mess around. In no way is this a definitive history of the organ. There is so much scholarship done on the topic and people dedicate their whole lives to not only studying how to play the organ, but just studying the importance of this instrument over time. It really is, in my opinion, like the first synthesizer. It's the first instrument that allows for you to make so many quick tonal and timbral changes with your hands right on the fly. So we're just going to go through a few pictures here. I want to start by talking about the tube itself or the um, pipe itself in the case of the pipe organ. So we see here with this pan flute, we have a variety of different uh, tubes on here. And based on what we know about harmonics, how sound works, how sound travels, the longer the tube, the lower the pitch that's going to come out, the higher the, uh, the smaller, excuse me, the smaller the tube, the shorter the tube, the higher it's going to come out. Uh, of course, there are many other factors that contribute, but that's the basics right there. If we look at a flute itself, it's the same exact thing, only we have buttons that will determine the length of this actual tube. So if we were to just blow over the mouthpiece here without pressing on anything, we're going to get the lowest pitch, the lowest tone that that flute can produce. And if we click this very highest one and hold it down, we'll hear the very highest pitch. It's usually incredibly shrill that the flute can put out there. How does this relate to the pipe organ? Well, it's the exact same philosophy, only we have individual pipes for all sorts of different notes, pitches, timbres, and various amplitudes as well. And pipe organs can range from, you know, 100, 200 pipes up to 10,000, 15,000 pipes. And this is just a great example of seeing the variation in pipes. And you've probably been in a cathedral or been in a church and have seen all the pipes and have wondered, why exactly are there so many? Why are they all there? And well, the reason is with something like a pipe organ, we have dynamics control. Like, you know, a piano, if you hit it softer, it plays a softer note. If you hit it harder, it plays that note harder as it strikes that string with more force. An organ's a little bit different. With an organ, it doesn't matter how hard you hit the key, it all has to do with what pipes are playing. And so we have some long, big, round pipes that are going to make a really loud sound, a super low sound. We have some skinnier, really long pipes, which it's not going to put out quite as much. The little slit of how much air comes through, that's also very important. And I don't want to go into all of the engineering about how you construct and make a pipe organ. I just want you to see the variation in size of pipes. So we have these tiny, tiny little less than an inch um, in height pipes, and those are actually going to put out frequencies that oftentimes go above our own range of human hearing. It can go below and above our range, which is pretty cool when you think about it. And it's a, a synthesis, a synthesizer freak's dream to have this much control over the frequency spectrum. Now, the other thing that's pretty cool about organs is that they operate from what's called a console. It's very much like a mixing console. And in fact, many pipe organs have more controls and are more complex than an actual mixing console that you'll sit behind. And you can see that we have all of these different registers here. We have four different keyboards, all capable of playing their own unique timbres. We also have a bass pedal board down here. So you play with two hands and you play with your feet. So if you want to really hit the sub, you just slam this down here with your foot. And then we have a bunch of these additional stops uh, little knobs that you can pull in and out to evoke different timbres from the pipe organ. And these can range from being able to evoke an entire symphony to just the subtlest of flutes. And the church, in what the service needs, actually really needs an instrument like this. And back in the day, the church was all the people had. That was their whole entire life. And they wanted a musical instrument that would be able to accommodate those services and accommodate all of the various stories 
that, you know, you read about in the Bible. And to do that, you need something like a pipe organ. You need all of this control to determine how many of these pipes are playing out at a given time, what sort of timbre you're evoking, and also how loud the instrument is playing. Uh, I've certainly been in church services where at the start they play a really loud processional hymn, and then middle of the service somebody goes up to perform a solo, and the organist is playing the most beautiful, subtle little flute passage. So there's so much control that we can have over an instrument like this with all these different pipes, and it can evoke so many different timbres. Uh, Really, really interesting. Now, a pipe organ is really expensive, and it can cost, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. It's a little bit too much for most of us. Eventually, somebody developed a much cheaper alternative to that for smaller worship spaces and also something that's a little bit more portable, and that is the Hammond organ. The truth about the Hammond organ is that it was developed and discovered by accident. Mr. Hammond himself... Uh, was not a musical guy, had no intention of making an instrument. His company, which made electric clocks, was in trouble, and they kind of stumbled upon a way to create tones uh, electronically. And I'm not going to go into those details of the engineering. It's rather complicated. It might go over some of your heads. It goes over my head. So I'm not going to cover that. But basically, he came up with this instrument that sounded very similar to a pipe organ. And a lot of churches bought these up as a cheaper alternative. Uh, The pipe organ companies weren't too happy, and they sued. But ultimately, uh, many experts couldn't even tell the difference between the two. If you programmed this guy uh, very similar to a pipe organ, you could get very similar timbres out of it. Here's another view showing you these draw bars. And keep that word in mind. So with these draw bars, and there's uh, different draw bars for the different registers here. And I think there's other draw bars that actually can uh, evoke more of a percussive type sound. How you program these in is really how you control your instrument, the timbre of your instrument, the harmonic series, the harmonic spectrum. If all of these are pushed in, you're not going to hear a sound. And that's really interesting. This is why this is one of the very first synthesizers to be developed. And it's really additive synthesis in that way. You're adding to the frequency spectrum you're not taking away, and you're not doing any frequency modulation. And here's just a quick diagram showing you on the classic Hammond which each of these draw bars would correspond to. So we have the fundamental, and we see here an 8 with a little mark. What is that corresponding to, you might ask? Well, that's corresponding to pipe organs and the length of the pipe. And you'll see this in many analog synthesizers too when you have to control the pitch. With a pipe organ, the higher and longer the pipe, the lower the pitch. Easy enough. So this is a little shout out to classic pipe organs in that with each of these, if we uh, want to evoke the second harmonic, that's quite higher. It's an octave above. And so we can evoke the four foot or the two foot or the one foot. And then we have these various other numbers of ratios. Hmm. Where have we seen ratios before? Oh, yeah, with harmonic series, with the harmonic spectrum. So all of this stuff corresponds, okay? It's very, very important. I hope you guys are uh, seeing the connection here. Uh, Really, it's very, very interesting stuff. So here's the back of one of these B3s. This is uh, the amplifier stage here, the preamp, tube preamp. We also have all the little tone generators in the back. And here's where we have this spinning wheel which is actually able to generate these different tones, get those to play out. And then typically what you have with a Hammond organ is you run it from the preamp into a Leslie speaker cabinet. And we're going to talk about the Leslie in just a second. The Hammond company went out of business sometime in the 70s or 80s, perhaps. And Suzuki stepped in, bought the Hammond name, continued the company's tradition. And now they make like really good especially aesthetically, reconstructions of the Hammond organ. They call it the new B3. The B3 is the most famous of all the Hammond organs. Now, this one uses digital technology, so it looks nothing like this, but I think they've recreated the preamp stage exactly the same, and they've also created or recreated the Leslie speaker. So you get a very similar sound, but it's a little bit different. When you're pulling these draw bars, you're not doing the same thing. You're just changing something in a computer chip 
as opposed to actually changing something here in uh, <laughs> what is really a complete mess. goes way over my head. So speaking of the Leslie Speaker cabinet, uh, the Leslie Speakers were designed by, uh, not by Hammond, by a guy named Leslie. And actually Hammond felt threatened by the Leslie Speaker and tried to get it out of business, tried to put the guy out of business. Didn't work. People just love the combination way too much. And the way a Leslie Speaker works, it's like a classic amplifier in a lot of ways. We have the woofer right here. We have the tweeter here. And so the signal gets played out and down and it goes through this like spinning wheel, which will do some really interesting things to the sound. Same thing up here with the tweeter with the horn. And here's what it looks like. So imagine here's where the signal is coming up. There's the horn spinning. Here's where the low frequency is coming down. And here's where that guy is spinning also. Okay, so that's my really quick rundown. There's so much more you can learn if you want to look into it. I find the pipe organ, the Hammond organ, uh, truly fascinating. It's a great form of uh, distraction for me. But we can go into Bitwig and look at their organ, and their organ is using draw bars, and that should immediately make you think Hammond, and it's going to operate like the Hammond. So if I try to play a note right now, we can see a note is coming in, but we're not hearing anything, and that's because all of our draw bars are down. So if I look in here and I find the primary, this is the fundamental. And as I pull this up and play a note, we can see I'm currently playing uh, C4, and it's playing a C4 now. So a synthesis topic that a lot of people take for granted is that as you play up the keyboard, The instrument is adjusting, it's changing the frequency, it's keeping everything in tune to that equal temperament tuning system. But on old school, on analog synthesizers, it would take a ton of time for people to tune these instruments because you have voltage coming in and it can be really hard and finicky to control. So don't take it for granted that your synthesizer just plays different notes. I'm playing a C here, now I'm playing a D. So there's some key tracking there. There's key tracking to pitch, and most synthesizers do that by default, but uh, just remember that that's a really integral part of almost every single synth, especially those that are tuned and are trying to play uh, musical notes. So as I said with the Hammond, we have the ability to evoke different harmonics, and we have a sub here. So my guess is this is gonna play a C, just an octave below. there it is. So we've added in some sub. We can also add in the eighth. And if you think about the various scale degrees, we have the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. And then eighth is back to C. So this is going to be one octave up, I believe. And we can check it. C5. Uh, we have the 12th. We have the 15th. That should be two octaves up. We can check that as well. We then have the 17th. The 17th is an interesting one. We'll talk about that. We have the 19th, and then we have the 22nd, and the 22nd should be yet another octave up. So what we're doing here is adding to the frequency spectrum. Additive synthesis, the most basic kind of synthesis there is, but it lays the groundwork for everything to come because we have such great control in the harmonic series and harmonic spectrum. So what started with something very thin, we can grow. Now we have more of an organ sound. So Bitwig has done a good job of keeping this very simple for us. There's really no setting you can put in here that's going to sound dissonant or bad. Even on the Hammond, it's very difficult to pull those little draw bars out and make it sound bad. 
Uh, but Bitwig has made this easier for us. We have control on the fifth here. So if I'm playing a C, I can add in the fifth. Or if I'm playing a C, I could actually... Now we're out of tune. Now I'm hitting a C, but we're playing a G. So that's one thing to be very aware of. You can do that. And I could actually keep adding to this fifth. That should be a G an octave up. And one more G. So do be aware of that. But uh, typically, you will have your primary frequency in here. Uh, so we'll pull the primary back up. We'll add in the fifth now, which simplest ratio, or one of the simplest ratios apart from the octave, it's the three to two ratio. So now we have a C, we have a G. We can add in the third as well. They only give us one drawbar to control the third, the major third, which I believe is like a five to four ratio. So still very harmonic, very consonant. It's gonna work. Uh, and that would be the 17th. So this is just gonna give you a little bit of extra flavor. So now we're basically playing like a C major chord just with some kind of extreme voicing. And now if we actually play the major chord, the major triad, I should say, uh, it's gonna sound <laughs> quite different than if we have this these out. So let's just do that one more time. Okay. So we can add in a bunch of these different harmonics now to come up with something pretty interesting if we'd like. I might hype this ninth, uh, the 17th just a little bit. The other thing about this instrument is that it is not velocity sensitive. If I slam this key, or if I just lightly touch it, no difference, just like an organ itself. Uh, because what's producing the sound, especially in the old pipe organs, is there's just a bellow underneath, this huge generator of air. And when you click the note, it's just opening that up. It's letting the air come through. So there's no velocity sensitivity on an organ. But if we want to try to emulate the classic Hammond into the Leslie, we can do that. And I'm going to show you how we can do that. The first thing I'm going to add is a chorus. I'm going to get this some stereo width. Right now it's mono. Let's turn this into something a bit more stereo. I'm also going to add a reverb first because this can also give me some width. Let's make it like it's in a big space. Four seconds is usually a really good time for uh, something like this. sounds absolutely fantastic. I'm just going to take an EQ2 and take out any possible mud down here. I don't want to take out too much though. I like trying to make this a nice rich full organ sound uh, because if you have an organ and you're really playing away on it, you don't need a whole lot more. So next I'm going to add an FX chain 
And here's where it gets kind of fun and interesting. Inside this, I'm gonna add an FX layer, I think. Or maybe not, maybe I can just add the mid side. I'll just add a mid side in here. So we can see we're now getting level from the mid and from the side. In the mid, I'm gonna add an EQ2. I'm gonna hype the bass a little bit. I'm gonna actually pull this up to maybe 200. And again, this is just real quick. I'm going to cut out some of these highs. Cool, I'm very happy with that. Now I'm going to do the inverse on the sides. Go up to about 200. Decrease this and increase this guy a bit. Awesome, I like that. Very cool, and now let's go ahead and look for our rotary device. When I covered the rotary, I intentionally didn't explain it as being like the Leslie speaker because I didn't want people thinking that you can only use it for organ sounds or for guitar sounds. You can use this on everything, but this is what's going to give it that typical Hammond type sound. Also, maybe a little bit of distortion on the low end going in. Might actually use uh, one of these guys. I'm actually going to use the tube here. If it opens up, okay. Perfect, and now we have the rotary. Let's get this sounding cool. We'll have this one going slow. Then on the sides, we're going to have a rotary that's going very fast. They actually, what gives the Leslie such interest is that they actually spin in different directions. Now, we can't really emulate that, but what we can do is give them different speeds to at least make it a little bit more interesting. that might be a little high is that distortion so we can pull the dry wet down a bit fantastic what a great organ sound and then if we just want to add a little bit extra we can go back in here and just hype some different harmonics is probably too hard anyway I don't want to get bored down here but you can see that there's a lot you can get out of this guy awesome very simply very easily and why not let's uh, take this whole let's add this let's just pull this up here and let's end with a little bit of Bach
The other thing I need to mention about the organ, we obviously know what can go into the effects slot. We're going to leave the note effects alone right now, but we have these additional controls right here. And the TIMB is very unique. The other ones are pretty simple. We have an aftertouch control. Okay, and aftertouch is only going to be relevant to if you have a keyboard that allows for you to do aftertouch. And aftertouch is clicking and then holding down even harder. It has like a second stage. You'll know it if you have it. So I can just show you a quick example of aftertouch. Click the arrow, decide how much I want to modulate by. This is going to be extreme just so you can hear it. Okay, so you can do aftertouch on anything in here and I believe you can also impart aftertouch on um, like a filter if you wanted so we could use the aftertouch and also when we hold it down since we're adding in that extra harmonic we can pull back on this filter yeah that was way too much but you get the gist you get the point we also have the mod wheel so the mod wheel, again, on your uh, keyboard, if you have one, you know what it does. And I'm pretty sure the mod wheel will also let us control something inside of uh, the effect portion here. Yep. So let's pull this up, select the mod wheel, and also we'll have the mod wheel add a little bit in there. So... both aftertouch and mod wheel. And last but not least, we have this TIMB. And this TIMB stands for timbre. And timbre variations are only possible inside of the instrument itself. You can see we can't control any of the built-in effects. And if you had a note effect, you couldn't control those either. But what I can do is I can route timbre to one of these harmonics go into a MIDI clip like we have here. Let's go to where we're playing from. We'll go to around 17. I can pull up my additional note expression. I can select timbre and hopefully with the pencil tool, I can just draw in something random quick. Will it let me do that? It may not. So I will have to go in here manually and do this. And so what I can do under the timbre section is if I change these guys around quickly, we can hear um, the variations with these different notes. And uh, this is going to take way too long to do. I wish I could use the pencil to do that. But I can't. Uh, you should get the point, though, if I play this back from right here. And we look at the instrument. You can see that changing and that actually does add quite a bit. It's pretty cool to do something like that. So that's the organ device in all of its glory. Feel free to go through, mess around. It's hard to come up with a bad sound out of it. Feel free to add any kind of additional effects you want. Keep an eye on the span. Watch and see where the harmonics are coming up. Listen closely and hear how is that relationship working. Is it consonant? Is it a little bit more dissonant? Is it just playing octaves? all those sorts of things. So thank you so much for watching and you'll hear from me again in the next lesson. Take care.